We are talking about Shomlo Leisure Centre here and this project came into the office as a collaboration. So it was, it was for ACT government, it's a public pool and we collaborated with Kane Construction, who were the builder, um, ourselves obviously, and Celix um, as the engineers, as well as a whole design team, but that being the core, the core group of, um, of the design team. I'll just make that larger, thank you. Um, what we would like to talk to everyone today is obviously the project itself, the context and siting, why we chose Timber, which was a very quick decision. It was a very obvious decision and a very logical decision from the team. Um, the, the, the project itself came out as an RFT uh, early on in, sorry, in 2016. And it, um, it involved a design competition essentially. And so that's why we, we entered it as a collaboration, Kane, Ars and Selix. And within pretty much the first week, it was decided upon that we would use structural timber for the pool concourse. Um, and we'll get into why, I suppose, a little bit later, but um, I suppose the, the quick decision helped us a lot, which was fantastic. We'll also touch on design process and the installation. Um, basically, I want to just take you through a whole bunch of great pictures and try and explain them and what we did around them. So location, we are in Canberra, We're about 10 minutes out of the centre of Canberra uh, in Stromlo Forest Park. And Stromlo Forest Park obviously has Mount Stromlo in it. Um, it has a, it, it, it's including a whole master plan of, of sports uh, facilities, including what was uh, envisaged a leisure centre, albeit on the side of a hill. And because it's on the side of Mount Stromlo, it has some fantastic views, including the Arboretum, Black Mountain, Lake Burley Griffin, and even Parliament House. Um, as I've mentioned, and as you can see here, we are on the side of a hill. So one of the main considerations for the whole building, including the structure, was the slope and topography. Um, and I almost hold them differently because there was uh, man-made tears on this site, um, most probably a little bit abused this site after it was ravaged by bushfires in 2013. Um, so we had to deal with a lot of fill, which I think Darren from Selex almost pretty touch on, deal with the fill and also the topography. Uh, the, because we're up halfway up a hill, Architecturally, one of the main concepts was view. View out of the building and making sure that every public, every part of the public, everyone, including every user, had a view out of the building. Um, and, and that comes with the balance of also appreciating that this building and structure will be on display, seeing as it's halfway up the hill. So it was very, uh, it, it was, it was very important to us to make sure that the view from the surrounding suburbs, that this building was a landmark and didn't look out of place. So it had to emulate the surrounding environment and try to, try to um, work as one. Um, the site layout. So this is a diagram showing what the concept or the, the intention was for Stromlo Leisure Centre. Uh, halfway up a hill and being tears, as you've just seen, what we tried to do was form zones and put those zones, tear those zones, sorry, up the hill. So as you can see on your right hand side, which is further down, the embankment was the car parks. And then it was the entry zone, which was your, your entry, obviously, your gym and your cafe. And then we lined as you can see in the blue, we lined up all the pools in a straight north to south line in a, in a, on a tier through there. And then as we get to the back, you can see a service zone. And that service zone is pretty much buried into the mountain. These T 
tiers directly in zones, which correlate obviously uh, responding directly to view, solar amenity, serviceability and access. This is extremely evident in the next slide that I'll show you, which is the site section, which was devised really early on. And you can see the car parks to the right there, tearing down the hill, the pods, which we tried to keep quite organic and easy to view around, which were the entry pods, the, the cafe and those sort of things. And then you can see the pools next to the service zone halfway in the hill. And that pool concourse shows the, um, the lining up of pools um, and also the way we've opened up the roof and structure for that being to view over the car parks and to all those landmarks beyond. So why timber? Um, it's quite evident from the context, you will see that it's A on the side of a hill within the bushland and a bushland that is regenerating after a bushfire and uh, it is, is quite harsh. It's obviously Australian bushland, so it's quite sedate and natural. Um, and so to sort of pay respect to that and also not to stand out too much, but blend in, I suppose, timber was aesthetically quite, and from a planning perspective, very obvious from, from the get-go. But it also needed to tick some of the pragmatic boxes. So we will talk about some of these items here, span aesthetic, life cycle and some of the maintenance and durability that it, it withstands. Span. So as you can see from this photo, which is obviously a com um, it, in its complete state, you can see in the background uh, the splash zone and then we have uh, three other pools, a learn to swim, a competition pool and, and, a, and a leisure pool. And they're all lined up, A, to get that view that we've been talking about, um, to get Eastern Sun, which is coming in from your right, um, but also uh, to gain that, that solar amenity from the north. And, and to do that, we needed 37 metres on concourse. So if you start from a pr pragmatic point of view, if you line up the concourse, the, the competition pool and the, and the spectator seating, we needed that 37 metres, which timber could do. And you'll see up here that we've reduced that 37 metres down to around about 30, 28, which I'm sure Darren will have a direct num a specific number, but we were able to do it with timber and these large band glue lamb um, sections uh, through with the 37 metres and by reducing it down to about 28 with the, the use of these struts that you can see on the right-hand side. And they do also occur on the left-hand side. Aesthetics. So I think it's um, I think it's pretty obvious that timber gives a beautiful warmth to any space. It, it feels much more natural to the human. It, it improves um, indoor climate, um, but it also, for us, it had that natural uh, natural, it was a natural material and it had that natural feel, which was from the get go that concourse needed to bleed in to the surrounding environment. We had those pods out the front that you saw, which was something different, but this concourse definitely needed to feel like it was, it was part of the landscape. So by doing it out of timber, this was, um, was very favourable. Uh, and from, a, from an aesthetic point of view, we were able to also drive the profile. And you'll see here that we've, we've tapered the edges of certain profiles, like this being the strut. We've, uh, we've, we've reduced the size of them as they come to junctions. And we've been able to manipulate the junction and how, they, how the connections work, um, which was, again, extremely favourable and something that could be done in timber. So aesthetics obviously were a very um, important factor when choosing timber. Life cycle, or at least the environmental perspective of timber was also favorable uh, 
favorable pointer when choosing when choosing this material. Uh, although it came from Italy, it still had an extremely great statistics. I believe it contributes 226 tonne of CO2e to climate protection, even with manufacturing and relocating or delivery onto site. Um, so, I mean, that, that was fantastic and great to go back to the client being government and tell them that fact. Timber um, performs well and is quite stable in its environment. Um, this being quite a corrosive environment, we've done some specific things to make sure um, to reduce its, or to increase its protection, sorry. We've built in this datum, which you'll see in the background, which is a, a concrete datum, um, so that all the timber is out of the splash zone. We've also externally, obviously being in the Australian sun and weather, We've extended awnings and um, to allow for protection from sun and direct weather. So the awnings all extend past the timber and the timber is cut on an angle to ensure that, that it is not in direct, uh, direct a way of sun and, and rain. Maintenance, which was a which is a pretty big one for the government. Obviously they it is a government facility. Um, the maintenance is, a, is something that we considered quite highly, making sure that we have an accessible concourse as much as we can, noting its pools. Uh, but also what Timber allowed us to do was to put it on show, which in turn allowed full visibility of the structure. And when we have full visibility of the structure, we have casual surveillance of if anything's going wrong or if something needs maintenance. So that casual surveillance really worked in our favour for this. Um, we also, uh, as a team, chose single use uh, treatments on the, on the timber uh, in manufacture, which allowed an ongoing maintenance regime to be reduced. So they, they treat it once and it does not need to be treated again. Uh, condensation and thermal bridging. So appropriate measures were taken to reduce condensation and that was all pretty much done from an external point of view along this facade here and within, within the facade makeup. Um, and, and things like where we could discontinuous battens so that the, the bridging wasn't um, as much of an issue. Um, obviously it's timber, which is also uh, much less transferable. So that one was a real big th thumbs up for the timber as well. Um, some of these items that we're talking about can definitely be seen in section. This is a section through uh, the, the competition or the competition pool yet, yeah, which is the concourse. Um, and you can see the timber there uh, angling up towards the eastern sun and the struts coming down to that datum point. So basically, yes, we've added that datum point, which is almost a concrete or durability datum, which runs through the whole concourse. And we've only put timber above that datum point. We've also, as you can see, that 37, 37 metres, the minimum width over the pool, um, and the, the visual, the, the casual surveillance that we were talking about. Uh, it also worked in our favour that these pods out the front were, um, albeit contained from a corrosion point of view and a fire point of view. Um, so keeping that concourse separate and open um, worked in our favour. Design process. The design process was exceptionally collaborative between the whole design team, um, especially between Darren and myself, uh, and Kane, as I said from the get-go, it was it was almost a DNC because we had the builder on board from the first day, and we were having workshops extremely um, regularly, which was a fantastic experience. From very early on, as I've mentioned, it was a clear choice to use timber, and from most probably the second week, we were looking at well, what is this grid? And what can we use? It? How, how can it um, how can it work hard? And how can it, from an architectural 
viewpoint be very elegant still, noting that timber might have been a, a larger section, keeping the lightness of that of that roof was very important. So we worked hard with Darren to um, develop up this dual beam or twin beam system where four struts are coming down to a single concrete column with two beams over to two struts and two columns. So it's they, they work in unison and they um, work together and that's exactly how they had to be assembled as well. The, the connections were extremely important to us. So from a very early, uh, from a very early on, we looked at the connection points, especially this one, which was the four struts coming down to concrete. Uh, that could have been quite a heavy connection, but we worked with Darren to uh, keep that light and um, and. and and profiled, so you'll see that the intention was always to have those struts as a, as a profiled um, member. Just working through, obviously, how we got to some of these things uh, was through, as we all do, uh, sections of the building, how, how the connections work, how we extend the roof over to protect the timber underneath from an external point of view. Again, on the east, we did the same, uh, pulling the timber back, putting it on an angle, uh, all helped. And this being through from the north um, and, and just keeping all this timber, we kept all the structure back from the north, which protected it from a solar point of view as well. You can definitely see this structural module as it works in, in two in this photo which is looking towards the east and if you take a few steps forward you'll see all the views that you get over Canberra um, but I think that structural module can be quite light when due to this sort of twin module that we're using and creates a great rhythm along a very long concourse pool about 100, 100 metres this concourse deck is and creates a great rhythm as the light comes in in the morning. Fabrication. Uh, this is where Kane and the group, Kane Constructions and the whole group got on board uh, with Rubina uh, and started design development really. How can we do this? How, how can the connections work to both achieve an aesthetic outcome and a structural outcome? Um, so we worked with Rubina um, and Darren together to form things like not just the detail of the connections, but also the profile. How can we move away from a square profile, which might be the most simple, through to a bit more of an elegant profile where it tapers in at the bottom and the top and has uh, a, um, no sharp corners and those sort of things. So we worked quite hard with the whole design team to achieve that um, those profiles, which we believe sort of keeps it light and elegant. Once the shop drawings were done, the timber arrived in shipping containers through customs on site in a whole bunch of Meccano pieces almost. Um, and that's the picture on the left where all the timber was on site and then on the right hand side what you'll see is them starting to put it together and they had to put it together in these structural modules that we were talking about twin beams and they put them together on the side and one by one or two by two if you want to say a structural each structural module had to be positioned with a crane on top of the concrete structure um, and bolted by hand which was absolutely phenomenal to see. So that's pretty much the end of my pretty pictures. Uh, I think it's easy to say that the timber was a clear choice. It was a quick decision. It was logical. And I think it's, it's definitely the success of the project. If, if anyone walks in there, it's, it's quite overpowering and overwhelming the warmth that it gives it. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Belinda. Excellent presentation.
So we'll continue on with the presentation and invite Darren. So Darren, please, please take hold of the screen. Again, we'll, this is a thing called building design by, by case study. So welcome, Darren. No worries. Thank you very much, Andrew. All right. So, um, I mean, thanks, Belinda. That was awesome. And you probably covered two thirds of what I was going to say. So that's okay. Um, but we'll press on. So yeah, we were, first question is the journey. Um, so in October, 2016, uh, Kane came into our office. They were only new to town. Um, Tristan and uh, John Anastasov came in looking for consultants primarily and said that they were going to put in an AOI for Stromlo Leisure Centre. Uh, the big no, I'm just going to, sorry to interrupt you. Just, yeah, I'm actually on uh, presenter's view. So the, oh. you've rubbed all the wrong screen. So, so we can see your notes and things. Oh, okay. Where am I going to adjust that? Just get out of the uh, share screen and then grab the, uh, look, look at when you, when you press share screen, you'll see there's a bunch of desktop come up and just um, present on the right one. Sorry, my bad. Let me just adjust that. Share screen. Yep, so grab the share screen again and just um, Better? Uh, you'll run with that. Thanks. Thanks, Darren. Mm -hmm. No? That again? Just continue on, Darren. It's fine. That's right. So we, we met with, with Kane and said, yeah, we'd be more than happy to help you out. They were putting in this EOI. Um, it, it comprised of three bid teams. And the initial reference was the Gungahlin Leisure Centre, which um, uh, one, of the build, one of the guys from Kane had been involved in previously with his time at ADCO. So just looking at those photos of, of Gungahlin, it's uh, pretty straightforward and rather cost, incredibly cost-effective type of structure. You know, trusses, um, fly bracing, not a great deal of interest. So... We thought, no, we didn't want to do a structural steel trust roof over a long span for a few reasons. First of all, we knew the other ones would, other bids would be looking at steel. Um, but we didn't want to really sort of put ourselves lumped into that bid competition. One of the big things that we started with from day one with the pool environment is to minimise maintenance costs around corrosion, which, um, which is going to be an ongoing um, factor for the client. And if we can mitigate that, then certainly we've got a bit more of an advantage over, uh, over getting the, the job. We wanted to make a point of difference and provide a quality cost-effective public architecture rather than just a pool, which, I mean, if you look at the difference between Stromlo and Gungahlin, it starts to become quite evident as to why. Um, the other thing is that pools don't come around all the time. They're, they're quite, a, quite a, a very rare sort of job. So, you know, we wanted to make a, a statement, I guess. So we started thinking about why can't we do it in timber rather than steel? Um, everyone on the bid team was quite excited about it, but they said, well, has it been done elsewhere? And the answer is yes. And at the time we just went, look overseas, because all of these photos that we're about to show you now, or some of them, um, are from the UK, Europe, all of those sorts of places. So that one is somewhere in the UK. That's also in the UK, and I think that one is as well. That's a grid shell. Um, that was going to cost way too much for us to look at, so that one was thrown out pretty quickly. Um, but, yeah, plenty of timber examples. So once everybody was comfortable with the fact that we could do it, and we went, yep, let's give it a crack and see what comes out. Why timber? And Belinda's been right across this as well. Um, the first thing, as I said, it's maintenance-free slash friendly. It's not susceptible to corrosion in um, under certain, uh, limited or um, certain relative humidities in pool environments like steel is. Uh, definitely uh, sustainable and from your renewable sources, which we thought the government would also be very, very excited about. Uh, one, of the, one of the statistics in this job that blows me away is that the 300 odd cubic metres of timber that comprises a Stromlo was regenerated in Rubner's forests in northern Italy slash Austria 
in 10 minutes. And I thought originally that's a misprint. I thought it was 10 hours. No, it's 10 minutes. That's a very, very quick regeneration rate, which means they've got a lot of timber just out there. They've got a huge forest. Um, architecturally and aesthetically, it's very appealing, as Belinda has also stated before. It's warm, it's soft, it's lots of nice, very fluffy words that, that everyone likes. <laughs> so, um, so we started with some initial concepts, as you can see there, with our timber. And Belinda's right, it was going 37 metres from side to side. We introduced some diagonal members to cut that span down to limit the amount of depth, reduce the depth, improve the cost efficiency to get some continuity running through there. And that is about a 27.5 metre span from diagonal strut to diagonal strut. Um, we did originally have single diagonal struts at the front here rather than doubles. And we had them all at seven metre centres. But then Belinda made us work for a living. And she said, what about if we halve the number of concrete columns and put them on a diagonal to make like a tree. So we had a look at it and went, yeah, that looks okay. We didn't have any problems in, in doing that. What we did need to do at the top here at the connection between the strut and the rafter is um, introduce some tension ties to stop the thing from rolling or rotating under the change in direction of force. That was about the only other thing that we really need to do out of that. So you can see here original concepts from Cox as to what we were going to do. If I just go back to my model. Oops, sorry, go back one. That's our original sort of concept markup based on their drawings. And we're looking at a meter by 200 GL18 rafters. So the glue lamb was a grade 18 that we were looking at to start with. Um, once the contractors got hold of it, their proposal was to go back to a GL13, which meant we went with a more sustainable timber, um, which ended up being a spruce. Could have been a radiata pine as well, but they went with the spruce by the looks of it. Um, so we went with that. Uh, that's about the only difference really in the structural analysis is we just had to deepen the rafters from about from 1,000 to about 1,200 by 200 to get that to work to their requirements. Um, at the end there, you can see there that we don't, we no longer have the Y column at the back. We just have a, a vertical column with a diagonal brace that racks into the, a concrete slab here at the concourse, the upper concourse. And the front was a, proposed a Y column, but that, that right-hand side Y column doesn't penetrate the glass facade. It goes vertically, about the only other change. So we set about modelling it, which is relatively straightforward in Strand and it's to AS1720. Not a great deal of issue there. Dead, live, wind, earthquake, everything. All of the timber struts come down onto 1,000 by 500 concrete columns, which cantilever up off um, 1,200 diameter piers, which go down through about 10 metres of fill and compacted soils. Uh, the pools are also founded on the rock at 10 metres as well. So all of the superstructure is founded on the rock. All of the lightly loaded concourses, et cetera, are on floating slabs or raft slabs on compacted fill on grade. So there is no, there's some potential differential movement that's negligible between the slabs and the, and the superstructure, but all the superstructure, including the pool, is all found to the same stratum. So we did this as an initial concept. This, this went out as our tender which was then um, tended to all corners of the world, um, New Zealand, Australia, and then Italy came through with, with Rubner to come in with a, a price that was um, suitable. Uh, one of the other things that we had to, 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 to consider as we were going is we thought that we would be using 316 stainless, um, but then when we did some more research, corrosion pitting is an issue in 316 stainless connections, and it becomes difficult to detect until a point of where it might, there's potential failure. And corrosion pitting is where all of the corrosion happens inside of the, the steel material, the stainless steel material, whereas your, the, you know, your oxidation process is, is done through a pitting area down into this larger and then gets larger section of corroded material, providing the um, anodic and cathodic reactions to to fuel that um, so out of that 
in our research, we discovered that a high quality hot tip galvanized connection is more corrosion resistant, was also more cost effective. But we needed to make sure that it was a high quality um, corrosion protection. Uh, there are some Chinese ones out there that are, are fairly sort of thin. Um, so we had to specify to make sure that we had the right connect, uh, bolts, plates, et cetera. And Rubner were also part of this because they were involved in the connection design and they made sure that all the plates, et cetera, were to that specification, which we reviewed because they're using Eurocode and made sure that all of the, um, the details, the specifications, the dimensions, the thicknesses were all okay. So then, as I said, the bulk of this thing went to went out to a contractor to a do their review on the documentation, um, and they ran that through their engineers PTL in New Zealand, who were good guys to deal with. We had um, very good, you know, very uh, collaborative dealings with them. Everyone on this project was actually very collaborative, which is great. So then they went a bit set about how they were going to design, fabricate, transport, and erect these members. So you can see there, there's some, some snap, some photos on there or some snapshots of the connection plate details so they could get all these things into shipping containers to get onto a boat. All of the member connections so that we could get the loads through to the support. And as I mentioned, uh, no, I didn't mention before. We went from, yes, I did. We went from a GL18, which probably involved more Australian hardwoods, to a GL13, which was spruce, radiator pine, et cetera. So we had to increase that depth. That's just the finished output from Rubner as to once we'd finished designing, reviewing, detailing. And then they went into fabrication. Some of the connections that we were going through and, and sorting out, because all of the rafters are in the same plane as the um, purlins, and we had outriggers coming out to the north and the south of the building, we had to determine how we got this external outrigger to be continuous through this member. And that's just through some, some plated connections, which are then transferring loads in push-pull through the bolts through the timber back into the internal rafters. Connections, as Belinda mentioned before, um, again, all, all into a pretty much center lines into nodes on top of columns. Um, members tapered for architectural, um, me, architectural intent and for aesthetics. Um, and all the plates, again, all pre-fabricated, pre-dipped pre before being transported out to Australia. And then erection. Erection came around, as Belinda mentioned. Everything was bought in, in shipping containers, fumigated into the Sydney, of course, bought and trucked up to the back of the site where they were all fabricated in pairs on trestles and then brought in in pairs. Um, because every all of the struts at the back, as you can see here, are all ready to go, it'll take two, two bays. They're bringing this, this one around on the crane to sit on the back, bolt those ones up first, and then hang it off the front of the crane out here until they put the four struts in at the front. It's quite a simple and efficient and effective method. Um, each pair went in, took about somewhere between, if, you, if they were really going well, 30 minutes, if they didn't quite fit all that well, probably two hours, but still a really quick way to put in a really large roof. So again, more, more photos of what was going on out in the, in the field on this day where Kane invited everyone out to have a look. And yeah, all up, the whole roof was done in a month, which is a, a pretty impressive time frame. And finally, the finished product, um, which was a great journey. And we really appreciate Kane, Cox, Rubner, Thaker, uh, and everybody else that's involved for, for allowing us to be part of it. But yeah, definitely as a project, um, the use of timber was uh, A, the hero, but B, it made project sense, not just for one discipline like architecture or structure or whatever, but the entire project benefited from the use of timber.
And uh, yeah, we are looking at more in the, in the future. There's a lot more interest in timber now in Australia and it's growing. So it's, uh, it's going to be, be fun playing with more timber. That's about it from me. So thanks very much for, for listening. Okay, thank you, Darren. That was a brilliant presentation. Okay, well, yeah, well, thank you. And um, thanks to Belinda and um, on the presentation on Blue Lamb. It all obviously inspires others to take um, you know, a leap of faith. And um, I think in Australia, as Darren has already just said, the interest in timber is much, much greater than it was when I first started working on these mass timber um, projects. So I'm now with Exlam, uh, which is a company that provides... Uh, or for any kind of an end-to-end -end solution, but XLAM is part of the Hind Group. And Hind Timber is a company that's uh, known to many people for their um, structural framing and, of course, their structural glue lamp. And uh, they've been operating now since 1882 and it's still a private owned company. Um, what XLAM do uh, will, is to assist um, mass timber projects by providing what's best for the client and what's best, obviously, for the project itself. We don't just focus on the CLT, for which what we are mostly a manufacturer of. Um, that's our core business. We will sometimes be um, the structural engineer of those projects, and sometimes we'll also be subcontracting the installation, and uh, maybe at some time in the future we'll be a link and supplier for those mass timber projects. Uh, for us, um, you know, it's about the design, the supply and the install. And uh, I think what we see is that's um, shortening the supply chain of procurement pathways and, and becoming very popular. Um, XLAM conducts as an Australian producer, has to do extensive fire tests in accordance with our Australian standards, and we have a very large range of those. We also do extensive uh, acoustic testing on our products, and we've got a very good relationship uh, and software packets that we use internally, we don't export it out, um, to help develop those acoustic solutions. And of course, we have a team of people across the Australasian region, including New Zealand, Australia, and um, we take that information and we've now delivered successfully in excess of 800 projects. Um, those projects range from a, um, small domestic residences to um, significantly large uh, buildings and this year or last year was my first year in the XLAM business and we delivered a 10 story building of CLT and Blue Lamb to Brisbane. Um, as a business unit, um, we have, we've done a number of swimming pools ourselves, uh, worked with a lot of architects and engineers and uh, we do have a, a couple of standing customers that do fairly regular work in that space. And uh, of course, we, we, as a manufacturer, we, we offer in Australia, Australian species, but we also work with overseas suppliers. So hope if you've got any questions on me, please put them through and uh, Andrew will um, direct those to me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, great pre presentation, uh, Belinda and Darren. It was great to see that up on screen. Um, uh, regarding Stromlo. Um, look, a little bit about myself. Um, our company is Tekka Australia and the recently formed um, Tekka Timber. I'm actually a co-director in that company. Um, I've actually been in the building industry myself for 32 years. Uh, I've been a registered builder with a, a number of businesses um, for 28 years. So I've been in the building game for quite a while. I actually went to um, Italy seven years ago with another company I represent, which was a, a Galena polycarbonate product. And I was taken to Rubna um, up in Bolzano. They call it the Timber Valley. Uh, for those of you that haven't been there, it's absolutely beautiful. And I actually fell in love with the concept of timber building right from that, uh, right from when I walked into that factory, seeing just actually how sustainable it is and actually seeing the process of the, uh, from design engineering to manufacturing to on site um yeah made us think yes we need to do this a little bit more in australia um from that very start uh from that day we started to form a partnership with rubna holzbell um and progressively it's been uh, very successful in that time we've managed to um, start off small with um, some really nice projects which you may have um have seen along the way, which was Marrickville Library. Then we uh, experiment a little bit more with Chadston Shopping Centre, which is a standalone 
uh, structure, which actually is um, out in the weather or part of it. Um, and then we've moved up to some other projects of, of, of course, Stromlo Aquatic Centre. Um, and we're involved with a few other aquatic centres, uh, one at the moment, and um, some grandstands and some other um, projects as well. Um, our focus or our role, our focus for the Australian industry is we like to be involved with big span, bespoke type buildings, um, anything that's different. Um, Rubna actually have 20 offices, uh, 15 factories. So the, uh, the backup we need here in Australia is there. Um, and it's on a very large scale. They have been doing it since the 1970s or 1980s. So they're very, very um, skilled in what they, uh, the information they can provide us. Our role here is we really like to talk to architects, engineers for DFMA, um, design for manufacturing assembly. If you can talk to a manufacturer er at early days, it can save a lot of time. Our role is we optimize the supply chain. So, um, we actually control the logistics, the building methodology. We work um, with the design, the 3D modeling right through to completion. So it's actually has, uh, we're based in Melbourne. So we actually have somebody on the ground in Melbourne, which is myself. We have somebody in Perth as well that can actually um, handle everything that needs to be done um, to help out to make sure our projects are uh, delivered successfully. We have recently designed our own modular pool roof system. Um, which is 20, 30 and 40 metre spans with modules of five metres, uh, which is quite an exciting um, product that we've, we've, we did that during COVID lockdown. So uh, yeah, look, we're looking forward to, to moving forward uh, in the Australian industry. Thanks, Adam. We'll just get on to the questions, otherwise we're running out of time. Uh, thank you. So the, the, what we'll have is a, all the panellists just uh, be ready to answer questions. We'll start off with the uh, first one from Wayne. And Wayne is probably directed either at uh, Belinda or, or Darren. Uh, actually, Belinda and Darren are both probably common. During construction, there was was there any protection used to the for the exposure to the elements, i.e., rain, as it took a month to erect? And I think um, Belinda covered this in her presentation. So, probably let Belinda Belinda first comment. Yeah. So the protection um, was definitely the roof um, and the extension of awnings. Uh, over the timber structure. Uh, that was the main protection. But also in the design, we made sure that there was limited external timber generally. So as Darren suggested, we did have wireframes and we pulled them back up um, to, to be straight, to straightened on one side to make sure that they were internal. And Darren, do you want to have a go? Uh, during the actual uh, erection of the roof, there was no other protection other than the coating. Uh, but Canberra is a very benign environment and the timber didn't suffer for being exposed for only a month. Um, and as Belinda mentioned, all of the detailing around uh, the timber protection against the, the environment inside the pool was all taken care of, it was all designed out through exhaustive processes. Um, so yeah, it didn't, it didn't have any effect on the timber. I don't even think there was any rain during that month to be perfectly honest. Excellent. Uh, I'll, I'll invite Adam and uh, and Robert just to comment on what and I said is you had, you've had a construction coating put onto it, so it's just to protect it during the erection part of it, while it's during exposed. But uh, uh, Adam, do you just want to do a quick comment about what's the standard practice when we when you install building type structures? What type of coating you put onto it? Yeah, sure. Uh, look, with this pr particular project, we used a Hammond uh, double layer stain. It's actually the standard stain we we use for transport, to be perfectly honest. I find spruce is a little bit misunderstood. Uh, the, the grain structure of the spruce that was used in this project is very close together. Um, it's different to pine. And we actually, in this environment, it was actually designed for uh, up to 90 to 100% humidity, just for a couple of weeks in case we had um, uh, issues with cooling in the building. Um, the stain itself uh, was really just for anesthetics. Um, the product itself, as far as the spruce in this environment, um, is long lasting on its own. Okay, Robert, and just talking about your product in Exland, what do you normally do with uh, protection to the timber? Yeah, elements? sure. So, in, in past projects, we've always asked that the product be um, H3 treated to an Australian standard, um, AS1604 Part 5 for Blue Lamb. 
Um, but on top of that, yes, we would apply a some form of sealer so that uh, can be supported by the finished coating. Uh, quite often, those are product, product universal oil or dimension four. So those that's the normal procedure for weather exposure, and then the final coating over the top um, after the roof has been applied. Um, okay, thank you. Uh Thank you. I just the uh, uh, we have a similar question from Mark, who's answered, who's asked the same thing. So just like Alice has asked a question, and please uh, write through the questions if you can. The uh, to Belinda, when you, when you and Darren, please uh, follow the comment. When you first suggested timber to the client, uh, did you have to deal with any negative aspects, and, and how did you deal with it? Um, the client, as you know, was uh, ACT government, and so we we and came presented timber to them. Uh, they were very hopeful because of the great connotations that timber has, especially from an environmental point of view. But there was a little bit of a hesitation as to has this been done before, and I think Darren covered that off before we did give them references. Obviously, at this stage, they were mainly international. Uh, examples or precedents, um, but that was definitely enough to ease any nerves. Um, I think they were excited and that's, I mean, ultimately I think that's why we won the, um, the competition or the RFT at the beginning. Um, it was something different, yeah. Okay, thanks. Darren, do you want to make any comments? Um, yeah, I don't know what the, what the government's response was, so that's on Belinda, but um... Kane were quite hopeful as well, I, I guess. Everyone was hopeful that, it, you know, it, it was definitely feasible. No one had really done it to any um, large extent in Australia by the sounds of it at the time. So we were sort of pushing a few boundaries, but not a great deal. It, you know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a complex structure in that respect. It's, it's um, repetitive. It's rectangular. Um, so it, it, it had merit. The only, the only I don't know, no, no, yeah, Kane were happy. Kane were happy that we we're going to go down that path. They were keen. Um, I think it, it suited them in terms of construction as well. So it was really just whether or not the, the 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 ultimate client was happy to take that on board. And I think they're pretty pretty happy with the end result, don't you, B? I agree. Thanks, on building. I'm just, uh, and probably just a segue question. The next question is from Jared, and it's about costs. So do you know if there is a cost saving between glue and versus steel structures? Uh, there is not. Steel would have been more expensive. Um, the I hear that the timber over steel was about a 30% premium. Um, in terms of maintenance, I believe that maintenance costs are saving about $40,000 a year Okay, no, for, the, just, for the rest of the life of the building. I'll just bring in uh, Robert. There's a comment about just a general thing about you know, what should costs cost comparison between glue and steel? What do you normally, uh, what normally happens with buildings? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Look, from out my experience, um, you know, I've been in the industry for 42 years now, I think, um, the, the experience that I've faced is that we often look at a raw material price, not, not the long-term uh, benefits of one product over another, um, form of corrosion. And I don't think those coatings that are applied to steel often Appreciated. Certainly, they're, they're quite expensive, and as Darren says, maintenance on steel is critical. Um, if done right, the design life of that building, you know, factors in the design, factors in the treatment, coatings, materials, and the build, and of course maintenance. So I think if we can save, look at the long-term effects of a timber building, uh, I think we'll we'll generally see that we're in front on uh, on costs. And then we're running out of a bit of time. There's a comment just on, on the cost between not necessarily pool buildings, but to all, all buildings, uh, timber versus other, other materials. Yeah, DFMA is um, obviously where the major cost savings are made. And um, we see those significantly um, in all sorts of buildings now. And as um, the kit of parts comes together and we can build a roof like that in just over a month, um, where we can build a, a level on a building, a uh, high-rise building in under, you know, four days. Um, you know, there's benefits in doing lightweight um, and certainly in timber and certainly DFMA. 
there's a lot of benefits that are, when costed crop correctly, we'll see timber win out more often than not. Great, Adam. Thank you for that. And I'll just probably add a comment to it as well. What we find is that if a, a building is designed to be timber, then timber normally being, is cheaper. If the building is designed to be concrete or steel, then it's normally concrete steel buildings tend to be cheaper. So, uh, and I congratulate the team, team of Belinda and, and Darren and Kane for this, because they, on the outset, they decided that the roof was going to be in, in timber. And that's the reason why that, that, was, that was successful. So, so the key to it, and, and it's obviously demonstrated in this one, is get your team together, work collaboratively, and then the project will be successful. It's, it's when it's when it's uh, you're trying to swap out something later on that becomes cost, when the cost might not work out. At this point in time, I'd like to say thank you to all attending. We're just about to our uh, witching hour of, of midday. The, the, just a quick one going through the uh, CPD questions. Please just grab a screenshot of that. They were put up on the uh, Zoom area. They will be available on the, um, uh, with the uh, presentation that becomes available. Uh, I'd like to remind people about the re recordings uh, that will be available for the Blue Solution website and, uh, and uh, the Tim, Timber Building Series. We've now just done two of them. Uh, our next one is hotels, and uh, we have you know, two excellent presenters here. Uh, I'd love to bring back from Icon and Nathan and Ben Bow from this deck. They're just going to go, and it's, and it's going to be presented in a casual conversation form. Uh, they're going to just bounce off uh, their experiences with with uh, hotels as being the, uh, the, uh, the uh, being the interest, but they, it will include include type other structures like um, student accommodation and 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 those kind of things like that. So that's the next one for the building series for the Tuesday, Tuesday seminars, webinar series. We have uh, the next one's on the 16th. This is the, this is the by Tuesday presentation. And this one is going to be on Macquarie University Clinic Education Building, a lovely uh, building, which uh, is and presented to Luke Johnson from Texas and Mike King from Arab. So I look forward to that one as well. And uh, don't forget about the certificates for, for CPD. They'll be sent to you shortly, also containing the uh, CPD questions. And, uh, uh, and remember that we, we are available on the Solutions website. So in closing, I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Belinda and Darren. It was an excellent presentation. And, uh, and you're new to the Wood Solutions, Wood Solutions presenting, so well done. Brilliant presentation. And thank you to uh, our panellists in, in Adam and, and Robert and the other great content to the talk. So. Enjoy the rest of the day and we'll close off and thank you for your for your time.